in the synagogue that I work in, the rabbi's pregnant, uh, the cantor is the only reform, there's the only female cantor in the UK, our whole office is women, and both the education directors and the youth worker are all women. So, um, that's probably mainly down to you. Um, so I guess my journey, it's not, it's, I'm, I suppose, mainly about eight years old. Um, grew up in a reform community, um, Aileth in North London, where we had a, a female rabbi who wore a kippah. My parents were married by a female rabbi. Uh, all the women in my synagogue wore tzad it It's everyone who was seriously engaged. It was very much a match. Like, if you were serious and a man, you wore a tzad If you were serious and a woman, you wore a tzad the, the 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 kind of distinction was less men and female and more kind of who was serious and who was seen as serious or seen as kind of less serious. Um, when I was 13, I went to America and I lived with a family whose the woman was very involved in orthodox feminism. Uh, she was very involved in Hadassah, which is like the women's Jewish network, and she was very involved in the orthodox Jewish feminist world and Jofa, which is the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Association. And I kind of came back home and asked people in my synagogue, like, I was quite excited by all these things I'd seen, like Rosh Chodesh groups and lots of female rituals and women's things. And she was like, we don't need that, we're egalitarian. And I, like, for me that was like a symbol of where I felt the community I was in was at at that time, where feminism was the tool to achieve our principle of egalitarianism, and that was it. That it wasn't, and that she kind of even said, you, anyway, we shouldn't really say egalitarian, we should say equalitarian, because egalitarian implies a political motive, and we no longer need that because we're equal. And for me, that, like, it gave me a really strong question, is that if men and women are so equal and everything, does that mean I have to leave my gender identity at the door when I come into synagogue? Does that mean that if you're telling me I'm exactly the same as this person in every way, that there's nothing distinctive about me being female? And that was something that I found really difficult to grapple with and started to, I guess, reach back to my friends overseas and, and also kind of reach out to people who I knew through the youth movement I grew up in to kind of ask questions about, is, is this simply the end of it? That if we are nominally egalitarian um, or equalitarian and we kind of, we have all these things that you can do and it's very much a case of if you want to do it, you can do it. What does that mean for me in terms of defining my gender identity as a Jew and as a woman. Um, so my kind, of, my kind of journey into this starts with that question, that can I, and I guess one of, the, one of the things I think is interesting about this conversation is in many ways it's a response to an orthodox position and what we have from orthodoxy is a, an excuse for the way you talk about women as different but equal. And for me, like, in terms of when you talk about it in the framework of orthodoxy, the different but equal is almost a get-out clause for, for the way that male rabbis maybe dealt with the women who were, like, who, were, who were experiencing the emancipation of women around them and asking questions about where their role was in their community. Whereas for me, actually, different but equal is probably quite a good way of explaining how I see myself as a young woman, how I think perhaps a lot of the women who are engaged in this do see themselves, as in you are totally equal as human beings made in the image of God um, and totally equal in your rights to observe to whatever you want to observe, but just like I am different to somebody in my hair colour, in my political affiliation, my height, everything, like my gender is something that is intrinsic to who I am and I shouldn't like, and equality doesn't mean forgetting that. Um, so. I guess I kind of started there to explore different ways that women kind of connected with their, with ritual, with things that in many ways seem the preserve of men. Um, and also to, to look at the way Judaism intersected with things that were specifically feminine, um, with things about kind of what it is to be a daughter, what it is to kind of have maybe the potential to be a mother and all those things. Um, so I guess that's where my my journey kind of started and it's interesting because I feel like one of the products of the, of the, and I think especially in the States, of the, of Jewish women is sort of this like pinkification of Judaism where you kind of get pink talitot to match like the blue talit and I think that like, for me there are lots of questions bound up in the way that uh, Jewish women do things um, and like especially the, the way that kind of we, we sell Judaism maybe as a 
sell maybe as a brand to young people. It's kind of like, look, you can do this too. Here's a blue version for a guy, here's a pink version for a girl. And I think lots of the issues that we talk about, that we talked about in the past about the way men and women are different, still resonate when we talk about the way women connect to Jewish ritual today. So am I doing something wrong if I wear the same tallit as a man? Should I wear a different tallit? Or is it okay for me to wear the tallit I want to wear? What's the, is, is there something significant for me? If I choose to wear a kippah that looks like this, does this say that like I'm looking to... Does this say that... Uh, does it, sorry. Does this say that I... Can't, like that I... Either that I'm owning a ritual, I'm making it my own, or does this say that basically I'm kind of, I want to wear something cute and kitsch, so I'm going to wear a kippah. And I think like those are some of the issues. Anyway, so my general kind of interest particularly is in looking at the way that different women um, use art and poetry and narrative to connect with femininity within a framework of Judaism. So we're going to look at it a bit later, like women who use talit in art to kind of make commentary on the role of women in Judaism. And I guess also the kind of the journey back into opening our eyes as progressive Jews to traditional women's roles in Judaism. That there's still sort of a, a backlash almost against things like mikvah um, as tools of really archaic and disgusting purity laws and also things that aren't really relevant anyway because they don't really make sense because that's not what purity is. Dif different things that we kind of close ourselves off to um, that, are, that talk about the women's role in Judaism and like that maybe were rejected about how we can reinteract with those and embrace them and use them to kind of enrich progressive practice rather than kind of reject all out everything that kind of belongs to a traditional view of women in Judaism, so I guess. So, what we were going to do kind of on the back of that was, it was quite interesting because we both did the same thing. I guess like something that really interested me was a poem that I found, and I was about 15, and it said the following. What is a Jewish poem? Does it wear a yarmulke and a talit? Does it live in the diaspora and yearn for a homeland? And I felt like if you were to have any kind of stereotypical definition of what a Jew could be, that that would probably be like the things that you would pick up. Like if you asked somebody to draw a Jew, what would they draw? They'd draw somebody maybe wearing a talis. If you were to Google Jew and want to put a picture of a Jew in an essay you're writing, you'd get a man with a talis probably to fill in on as well, and a kippah probably with a big bushy beard. Um, and that there are, there are ritual objects that are totally bound up with 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 at least some ways that you would define Judaism. And those ritual objects, traditionally at least, are the preserve of men. So if there, so the question is, if, these, if either these don't need to find Judaism, and we're seeing Judaism in a very superficial way, or we shouldn't have to kind of like search for ways to identify with something in Judaism, that actually there must be some way of interacting with ritual, which Ellie wrote a poem about. Yeah. Um, has everybody seen to fill in? You've got pictures. They do. They do. Everybody know what to fill in is? No? Yeah. Okay. okay, you don't have to know. The, if I gave you the English name, it's just as mystifying. The e English name. Even to the Daily Mail this week, who wrote about a bizarre Jewish ritual on a plane where they had a, t a terror alert on a plane because somebody was putting on to fill in. And the Daily Mail headline was, Man Conducting Bizarre Jewish Ritual. And I was like, bizarre, maybe a bizarre ritual, but most of that, I'd say like a good like 50% of the Jewish world do it. Well, it's also, I mean, but the English word for it is phylacteries. I have no idea. I don't want the phylacteries. Phylacteries. I don't know what the etymology is. Fill in all the. This is a Barbie. This is Barbie. to fill in Barbie. Do you want to pass it around? This is to fill in Barbie. To fill in Barbie is a, depending on who you are, an abomination, a witty <laughs> critique, or a kitsch kind of concept made by a woman called Jen Taylor Friedman, who's, the, an, or, who's an orthodox woman who's the first Sopheret. So she's a woman who wrote a Torah scroll. And she made her as a commentary. She was shopping and she saw Halloween Barbie in their supermarket and she said, oh, she's got a really long skirt on. Yeah, that's a great outfit. I'd love to wear something like that. And as a joke, she made it as a present for one of her friends. And it's become a really interesting kind of commentary on if you have a doctor Barbie, if you have a nurse Barbie, if you've an air stewardess Barbie, why not have a tefillin Barbie? On the other hand, is this kind of a, 
it does this mean that the richer objects we wear are purely fashionable, basically? And do we just wear a talit because it's nice and looks pretty, or do we wear it for another reason? Mm. Okay. Just want to sort of, in a sense, add to what Debs has said, or, or not that, but just a, a slightly different approach to it, because of course, one of the things Debs is talking about is her own personal engagement as a young Jewish woman with what it means to be equal and what it means to be herself and to be different. I suppose from where I'm coming from, the whole notion of this kind of idea of femininity is something which I've never ever been part of. So I've never worn makeup in my life, I've never, you know, I'm, 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 I'm unusual. When I was growing up I thought I was part of the third sex, to be honest. Um, because I couldn't identify with my mother who put her face on, who's beautiful, but she, put her, she called it putting her face on. Um, so there's also an interesting thing about the binary nature of the way we think about what it is to be human, which of course, you know, is beautifully played out in the Genesis story, um, where you have a single human being that becomes two, and the first version is becomes two for sexual reproduction purposes, and the second version becomes two to have an other to relate to. But we are fixated on the binary, and in that binary split on what we think of as masculinity and what we think of as femininity, which I personally have never been able to identify with. So that's just one thing which is quite important to the writing of this poem. Um, when I went to um, Rabbinic College, to Lebeck College, we have a service on, in the morning, morning service, Shachri it's called, it's the name for the morning service. And there were no women at that time, or well, not many men actually, wearing to fill in. But I'm the sort of person who likes to try everything. And I was a student rabbi, and I was doing teaching at a reform synagogue, where the senior warden was really nice. He said, would you like to be a junior warden? So I started being a junior warden to learn the ropes. You know, there's nothing like knowing how the stage management of a service if you're going to become a rabbi. And I thought, I'll ask him if he wears to fill in. So I asked him. He said, well, actually, I do. He said, but, you know, I'm, I'm a Buddhist. This is a senior <laughs> rabbi. And a senior warden of the synagogue. I'm a Buddhist. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I think of it in a particular way as a Buddhist about it. I said, well, I don't care. Just show me how to do it. <laughs> so he showed me how to do it. And he, and he said, look, there's one piece of advice I'm going to say to you. This is really hard. Do not decide whether you're going to do it until you've done it every day for four weeks. Which, of course, is fantastic advice. Because if you just look at that and you think about what's involved in getting this stuff on, you would not choose to do it until you're absolutely, completely au okay fait with it. So I took his advice and I started laying to fill it. And I think that this poem is about the experience, in a sense, expresses the experience of doing that which is quite odd, that if you look at somebody doing it, um, well, it looks very bizarre, as this newspaper article says. So I'm going to read it to you, but I'm going to give you each a copy, because we're going to look, I want you to look at this in what we call Havruta, which is the Jewish style of study, which is to sit in pairs. You're not quite paired, so we may do it. It's a really awkward experience to fill in. In Israel, there's a, on, in the main street, so like their Oxford Street, they have in Jerusalem, there's a, like a group of really orthodox men who teach young boys to lay to fill in. Mm -hmm. So we went up to a group and they're like, all oh, the boys lay to fill in. And the boys all went, we'll only do it if you let her do it. And they all went silent. And so <laughs> like, we're like, oh, you can all go on your way then. <laughs> it's great. Okay. I cannot bind myself to you. I can only unbind myself continually and free your spirit within me. So why this tender, cruel parody of bondage? black leather straps, skin, gut, and sacred litany of power and submission, which binds us, your slave people, still. My own answer is wound around with every taut binding and unbinding. Blood rushing, heart pounding, life force surging, pushing, panting, straining, struggling to break through, to you. Blessed are you, our living God, sovereign presence of the universe, whose commandments make us holy and who commands us to lay to fill in. Mm -hmm. 